um, on the topic of libraries, comics, and superheroes of color and um, how they strengthen our reading communities. We're going to go ahead and start with our keynote panelist, Saladin. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm coming through okay? Yes. Um, hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us here. Um, I'm very excited to talk to everyone uh, throughout my career. Librarians have been sort of a huge part of, uh, of, of me managing to, to make a career out of this. So I'm, I'm very hyped to talk to you guys. Um, <clears throat> I'm not much of a super formal speech writer, so I'm going to be uh, ah, there I am. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to be uh, just kind of talking a bit off the cuff. And uh, I'd like to start, I guess, with um, my origin story, as it were, um, <clears throat> being a big part of most superhero comics, um, where where I got my powers, if I have any. I don't know. <laughs> um, I, so I'm from Detroit. I'm from, uh, I was born in southwest Detroit. And uh, I grew up in uh, Dearborn, Michigan, which is a, a kind of working class, uh, uh, well, a very interesting town, Henry Ford's hometown, uh, a, a pretty vigorous library presence there, actually, it was pretty important to me growing up. Um, uh, but also, uh, at least on my end of town, a very kind of working class town, an immigrant uh, community, and I grew up in a, a very um, densely Arab Muslim uh, enclave, kind of one of the most Arab and most Muslim spaces uh, in America. Um, in uh, the 70s and 80s, before this was sort of a big thing that everyone was talking about post 9-11, right? Um, <clears throat> and to really talk about um, my story and how I tell stories now, I need to talk a little bit about that community and, and, and where I come from. And really, um, one of the centers of gravity of that community, uh, and that was my, my great-grandmother. Um, her name was Alia Hassan. And when we talk about superheroes, I guess part of what I'm going to try and convince you over the next couple of minutes is that um, we need to not only talk about kind of the the superheroes we've been handed, um, but we also have to think about how the figures in our own kind of communities can kind of uh, translate into 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 heroes for us. Um, my great grandmother, uh, her name was uh, Aliyah Hassan, and um, she was uh, born in 1910 and lived a very colorful life. Um, she married and divorced several times at a young age, left an abusive husband at a, at a time when that was not easy to do uh, for any woman in America, let alone a woman in a kind of very small Muslim Arab community. Um, and uh, she moved everywhere from New York to Detroit to Mexico, um, just living an absolutely astonishing life in the kind of middle of the 20th century. She co-founded a labor union for uh, Egyptian longshoremen she became friends with Malcolm X and kind of helped guide some of his uh, transition to kind of a more orthodox Islam. Um, she fostered a lot of ties between uh, uh, black and Arab Muslims in New York at the time. She met uh, uh, Nasser, the president of Egypt, probably the most important Arab leader of the 20th century. And um, <clears throat> she worked getting into the sort of superhero inspiration things. She, uh, she got a black belt in martial arts and uh, she was licensed as a private detective in 1968 as a 58 year old uh, Arab American woman, right? And so this woman, um, Alia, when she moved back to Detroit, my great grandmother um, was sort of the matriarch of my family and was a, a, a powerful presence for everyone around us, um, uh, including my father. and. Um, I think if she'd been born to a different demographic, she'd have been a sort of nationally celebrated figure, right? Like, um, but uh, because certain stories are neglected, and I think that's part of our job as we tell stories about heroes and, and tell stories in graphic novels is who we're going to recover, right? Um, uh, she was a big influence on my father, and I found out actually only very recently, after getting into comics as a professional, that um, she... Uh, my, so my dad, when he was young, he was in what he now calls a, a club, but what we would, we would call a gang nowadays, right? Sort of um, late 50s, early 60s era um, street gang, right? And he wasn't much of a reader. He didn't care for reading. And um, my great-grandmother got him a subscription to Green Lantern and got him a subscription to uh, the Justice League of America, right? This is probably about 1959. And um, uh, he learned how to read from that. Um, you know, we were in, uh, we both grew up in Dearborn, my father and I, in a kind of, as I say, sort of working class community where 
um, you know, you were, you were in his era educated to go work in the factory, in my era educated for factory jobs that no longer existed, and uh, weren't really taught to think about books much. Um, but because of this woman who was really self-taught and had, had you know, taught me the Quran and taught me uh, the Arabian Nights and all of these stories, uh, and then found a way to reach um, my father through literacy um, when the conventional ways didn't work. And comics, comics was one of those. So this, this lineage for me goes, goes back uh, uh, very deeply. And, um, um, and it, as I say, it permeated sort of on down, you know. Um, my great grandmother had a lot to do with raising me um, as well as kind of raising the community around us. Um, uh, but even through my father, who was, uh, my mother passed when I was quite young and uh, he did a, a lot of the raising me as a single dad, um, you know, he, challenged me as a reader and I was in a place where you know the the schools were not very good um, many of the teachers were pretty hostile we had a sort of old guard of whiter teachers uh, who didn't like all these you know loud messy uh, Arab kids that they were teaching uh, there were too many of us in all the families and such and um, it was a uh, other than a few isolated great teachers and I will say wonderful school librarians um, you know, it was it was not a place that was doing what it was supposed to be in terms of encouraging our, our reading. And it was my father and my great grandmother and people in the community who sort of guided me towards that. And um, I'll never forget that after first grade, uh, when I was summertime, and all my friends were just running out and playing every day, um, my dad would make me write a story. Uh, every week I had to write a story for him. Uh, and one of the first things that I wrote was actually a comic book story uh, about a, a character named Saver Mouse, who was named that because, because he saved people, right? And the human dog, who is, as far as I can remember, just a badly drawn person with a dog face. <laughs> um, but but again, those those origins are there. And so um, for me, when I think about, you know, uh, where does where do I come from in comics, which is a kind of question I get asked a lot. How did you get here? It's, it's not a simple path of Marvel called me and this and that. It's this, um, I think, for, for many of us from communities of color in particular, um, uh, it doesn't, the story never starts with just us. And, uh, and for me, um, it's, that's, that's emphatically the case. And so, uh, I, you know, I went through school, um, traditionally uh, sort of, um, barely made it. <laughs> and I didn't think of myself professionally as a writer, but writing was something I did. And uh, uh, eventually I turned to uh, other forms of writing. Um, uh, I left sort of fantasy and comics and such behind. I started to write poetry and, uh, and eventually started to study that pretty seriously. Um, after some sort of rocky transitions, I ended up at um, uh, University of Michigan in Ann Arbor and started to study poetry formally. And uh, for years, um, I was uh, away from the sort of geek sphere, uh, writing sort of uh, poetry and publishing it in journals that no one will ever see, and um, uh, writing little literary fic pieces for myself and such. Um, but when I eventually decided to write a novel, I ended up sort of returning to my geek roots, right? And I decided I was going to write a fantasy novel um, full of sort of the kind of fantasy heroes um, that, uh, that permeate film and fiction and graphic novels now um but it wasn't going to be a european based thing it couldn't be for me uh, given where i came from and um so I, I wrote a novel called throne of the crescent moon which is sort of heroic fantasy novel um you know swords wizards monsters and all that but uh centered on a kind of mythic version of uh, of the medieval islamic world rather than the, the medieval european world and um and as i started to get back into that geekosphere to sort of learn how to write this book and to promote it once it was written and all these sort of things, I started, I started to discover something quite wonderful, actually, uh, toxic and wonderful at the same time, right? Which was the, the, the sort of the fandom of the internet and um, the internet of fandom, I should say. And uh, um, I did not grow up with the popular internet um, as, as a kid, right? Um, even though it started to exist and I was a geek, it was a, a kind of class question. Um, and so I came to the internet as an adult and as an adult writer and um, <clears throat> I saw these fandoms that were expressing the sort of things that I thought about as a kid, right? What if this character were actually brown instead of every person in this cast being white, right? Or what if these two characters were together who aren't supposed to be together, right? This man and this man, right? And all these sorts of questions that sort of 
floated around my consciousness because I'd had the benefit of, of asking those questions about the world in general was out there in fandom. And it was, it was a remarkable place. And at the same time, mainstream stuff was starting to reflect that, right? Um, uh, Miles appeared, Miles Morales appeared, right? And there was a big backlash about black Spider-Man, but there was a much, much, much bigger embracing of this, this sort of new era. And, and then not too much longer after that, Kamala uh, Khan as the new Ms. Marvel appeared. And so here I am as a fiction writer and an essay writer and a poet and a teacher and a lot of other things, watching this happen over in comics and also watching comics become this huge phenomenon uh, in other media, right? Characters from comics. And um, it, it just felt like serendipity. Um, Marvel called me based on the success of my first novel. And um, a number of people would ask me, would you ever go into comics? Would you ever write superheroes? Uh, and they always or often had these cringy suggestions as to which characters I would write, right? And there were always the, the one or two fairly stereotypical Arab characters that, that existed in, in DC and Marvel. There weren't a lot to choose from. So everyone was like, you have to go to Marvel and write The Arabian Night. <laughs> and I, I didn't want to do that, right? Um, and so when Marvel came to me with Black Bolt, it sort of felt like, it felt like when Spike Lee started to get to cast like A-list white people in his movies, right? <laughs> And um, I was like, okay, that's, that's an interesting challenge, right? And Black Bolt was a, not A-list, as a sort of obscure character, but was very much a tall, square-jawed looking white character. And, um, and I started to tell a story about incarceration and about <clears throat> leveling because he is this, he's this king. Um, and um, so he gets locked up with a character I've always been drawn towards, Crusher Creel, who's a sort of very two-dimensional working class thug and the depiction always reminded me of the kind of my uncles, right? Who were always kind of involved in sketchiness and um, uh, these kind of working class guys. But the depiction in this, uh, of, of this character had always bugged me. So I brought him into this book and, and started to ask questions about prison and about who gets thrown in prison. And to my astonishment, Marvel was, was pretty cool with it. And, uh, and so from there, it was a pretty natural path to kind of level up a bit um, into kind of more prominent characters. And now, um, I find myself kind of helping to guide the legacy of two characters in particular, Miles Morales and Kamala Khan, who are sort of the 21st century face of Marvel, um, the, the face that looks more like the rest of the world and, uh, and is, um, is, to me, everything that's sort of good and exciting about what's happening with superheroes right now. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty honored to be doing that. So. Um, so that's my ramble. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Saladin. You know, I wouldn't mind seeing a uh, saber mouse and a uh, human dog <laughs> in a uh, revival. So just, just, just FYI. Um, so, um, so Chloe, um, we, we are now, uh, let's, let's, let's hear what your, um, your, your view on the importance of libraries, comics, and superheroes of color. Hi, I'm up. Yes. Thank you for having me. Um, so I, <laughs> To talk about the importance of all of these things together, I also sort of have to get into my origin story a bit. Um, so I've read comics my whole life. Um, when I was a kid, I'd steal the newspaper from my dad to read like the Sunday funnies. Um, and Garfield was my favorite comic strip. And I would demand that my parents buy me all the Archie comics that were in the line at the grocery store checkout. Um, and I've just aged myself. Um, but uh, yeah, above all things, I loved to draw and to read, and um, comics were the intersection of those two loves, and because uh, I didn't have a lot of money, uh, well, like we were fine, but I didn't have a lot of money, so when I needed to read, uh, the library was the place to go um, for that, and still is. Uh, Unfortunately, when I was young, they didn't really have a lot of comics in, uh, in libraries. It wasn't really offered uh, as much as it is today. Uh, we get things like asterisks. Asterix was there and, uh, you know, Mouse was there later on. And uh, so you got some classics, but not really a, a wide uh, variety. Um, so I would go to comic book stores to just browse because I couldn't find it in libraries, which was where I was finding books and I couldn't buy it myself. But, you know, you sneak into a comic book store and, and you read it. 
And uh, then the guy behind the counter makes jokes about how this is not a library and you just ignore him and go about your business. Um, but comic book stores at that time, uh, especially in the South, were not a super welcoming place for um, a young girl to just be, just like exist. Um, and beyond just sort of the, the weirdness and hostility of, uh, the stores themselves, also the content of what I was reading, um, was not very representative. It wasn't very, um, diverse. And so it was really hard for me to see myself, uh, in those books. Um, even when I was reading Archie comics, you know, I wasn't particularly sporty, um, and I wasn't image conscious, so I wasn't I, a Betty or a Veronica, and I wasn't boy crazy either. I just really was a weird kid who was kind of morose and really bookish and not leggy or tall or blonde, um, and I didn't care about shopping. And also, one of my parents was brown, and one was white, and I was white passing, and no one ever talked about that. <laughs> so uh, I never saw myself uh, in comics growing up, um, and I didn't have anybody to sort of guide me towards healthy representations, uh, even if there had if those had existed, which by and large they didn't. Um, I think eventually I did see something like myself in in comics uh when i hit my teen years uh we finally got a female owned uh comic book store and so it was comfortable to hang out there and she was very understanding about the uh money situation so it was like having a tiny library um and she introduced me to all sorts of weird books like the tick and milk and cheese and uh there was this one book called gloom cookie and in that book, I finally saw something that was like myself. She was, uh, the main character was short and weird and bookish and uh, incredibly pale, um, which was uh, problematic for me. I mean, even in this webinar, you can sort of see how pale I am. Um, but as a kid, I uh, was very conflicted and my attitudes towards my background and my heritage and my family were very confused and unhealthy. So I would see these uh, goth characters in indie comic books and they were always very pale. And uh, I hated the yellow, like olive undertones of my skin. So I would take these lemon juice and hydrogen peroxide baths to try and lighten my skin so that I could look more like these perfect, white, pure characters. Um, and I mean, that lasted for years. Uh, anything I could do to make myself look like those girls in those comics, I would try. Uh, and it wasn't until I was in my mid thirties and uh, America Chavez was created that I saw a real version of myself in comics. Um, she uh, obviously has darker skin than me, but she also has a complicated and yet genuine connection to uh, Puerto Rico, to my culture. Um, I actually cried when she got her own series and it's not even that sad of a comic. I was just so overjoyed to feel seen and valued in this medium that I had always really loved. And uh, I had to wait three decades to feel that. So um, coming from a library background and coming from a background that loves comics, um, I've sort of made it my mission to try and meld those two things to make sure that people who maybe are on the lower socioeconomic end of things and don't have access to, you know, Amazon to buy any book that they want or even to go to their local comic shop and, uh, and purchase those comics. I really try to make sure that people know where in the library to look and where your resources are and who to talk to, to be able to get these books that show you, um, not just a mirror of yourself, but if you're coming from a different culture, a window into that culture so that you can see uh, and build empathy. And, you know, it to me, a library is about broadening your horizons. It is literally a doorway to 
to anywhere in the world. And it is a window into the mind of anyone in the world. And I think that comics can also be very successful um, at doing that. So I just think that it's a natural, it's a natural marriage. Libraries and comics belong together. And, you know, people of diverse cultures deserve to be seen and deserve to be included. And growing up, you deserve to to see that you have these options, that there isn't one or two stereotypical ways for you to be, that there literally is a world of possibility for you. Um, and I also, as I said, I think it's important for people from other cultures to see that, that you also have those, those options. So they don't see you as one or two things. They see you as a full complex um, human being. Uh, I think I've personally seen uh, an increase in the number of creators of color who are telling their own stories uh, and the numbers of readers who are really clamoring for that. Um, one of the things I love about today's landscape is that we're finally starting to see um, the results of earlier years of including POC characters in comic books. Um, at Image, uh, when we started you know, 25 years ago, uh, the company started with two African-American superheroes um, and that was amazing and it was really important in, in the medium to, to show them in that light but you also have to remember that those characters were written you know, by a, a couple of white guys and that's not a slight against them it's just that they are not going to be able to bring certain perspectives to those characters that you would naturally get uh, from somebody who would actually come from that community but you fast forward 25 years later and we suddenly have all these books who are, that are you know, written by people coming from that community and coming from uh, the full spectrum of gender expression and the full spectrum of sexuality. Um, you know, and not only are those books out there, but they're winning awards and you know, people are really asking for them. So I, I just think that making sure that we put those books in libraries um, so that we do the best we can to provide the most representative reading to every community, regardless of their ability to, you know, their monetary ability to purchase their own books. Libraries are so important. Um, I, they, I can't overstate the importance. So that's my spiel. Thank you for letting me ramble on. <laughs> No, this is a good ramble on. Right on, Chloe. I mean, that's, yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's awesome. Um, so I'm going to, let's move on to, um, to Deirdre. Um, Deirdre, what are your thoughts on uh, the importance of libraries, comics, and superheroes of color and how they strengthen our reading communities? Well, thank you for having me be a part of this conversation. I think my point of view is largely shaped by my role as an educator. Um, as a young person, just like Chloe, my Sundays were consumed with reading funny pages. Um, and comics have always been a part of my life, kind of independently. But as a professional educator who was working, um, I've worked in museum spaces most of my career. And while working at the Schomburg Library in Harlem, I was witnessing a new trend among my students who were middle and high schoolers who came to the Schomburg on Saturdays to study black history and culture. And that trend was their really robust interest in reading uh, manga uh, comics. And, you know, Naruto was everything <laughs> for them. And my lens toward um, inclusivity and making sure that not only the history that we teach, but the art that we teach and the geography that we teach and the politics that we teach is inclusive of multiple perspectives. I was questioning them just a little bit about, you know, are you also reading comic books that are inclusive? And do you know who those artists and writers are? Um, and they didn't. And so I made it my mission to start rounding up those comic books and to even begin to teach through graphic novels that featured um, either autobiographical uh, narratives like uh, John Lewis's March books, um, Malcolm X's graphic novel of the autobiography of Malcolm X, 
Um, and my students really taught me about the power of visual literacy um, and how these comics um, really were aiding their ability to engage with very complex issues um, around justice, around identity, around the socialization of um, multiple identities as um, we find everywhere in comics. And so I was further encouraged to want my students to know, wow, okay, now we've got them engaged in these diverse books, but we're finding that a lot of the creators of color were working independently. And so I thought I could bring my students together with these creators of color writers um, who really represented uh, not just diverse stories in terms of them being a person of color, but really diverse nationalities, diverse languages, um, and diverse gender identities. Um, I could bring them together with my students, but I wanted to also expand that and bring them together with the community at large. And working in a library, it's a, a place of trust and a place of community engagement. And so I was perfectly positioned um, to do just that. And that's how the Black Comic Book Festival at the Schomburg Center got started. And we literally thought, okay, we have a small network of about, I at the time of about a dozen, 20 some odd creators of color here in New York City. We'll bring them together with uh, my students and open the doors to the public and maybe 500 people will come. That would be fantastic. But like thousands of people came. <laughs> and it, it, it showed me and you know my, the co-founders of that festival just what a voracious appetite there was for this literature and all of its diverse forms and also creating you know a space for dialogue about the comics and the stories that are being told that's the other part of producing festivals and events that i really invest in it's it's presenting the books making sure they're available helping teachers and librarians um, have access to these titles so that their collections get built out but i'm also very interested in the conversations that we are able to generate uh, from these stories and so panel discussions workshops um, hosted at a library around the love of reading comics and graphic novels is, is something that to me is a really perfect marriage. Um, and like everyone else on the panel in, in recent years, in the past five to 10 years, the kind of general trend toward more diversity in this medium has been tremendously, um, it's been a beautiful thing to watch. It's been a thing to watch critically. Um, and I've been working with teachers and educators to help them understand how comics can be used to foster critical conversations because, I mean, just like other forms um, of literature, you know, having a critical perspective on these very creative um, forms is is important so i've been very um proud to be a part of opening up the the field of interest um to the larger community through a library um and knowing that reading is fundamental to everyone's development young people's development as well as adults um shaping their political and social ideas. Um, comics, graphic novels, and libraries are really a, a strong match and, and should continue to, to be a, at the center of doing this work. That's amazing. Thank you, Deirdre. You know, um, I'm, and you spoke on it a lot, how the, there are a lot of positive changes coming as a result of seeing more uh, inclusion of people of color in, in comics. Um, and I'm, I'm going to ask you now, do you, um, you know, a lot of positive changes, are you seeing, and then this is for all of you, are you seeing challenges as a result of this? Um, you know, the negative feedback and it's, you know, comics are, seem to be always, um, you know, I, there's always a group of, uh, in, in the, uh, the, the most challenged books list, every uh, band books week, every year, um, you see like a handful of comics, comics tend to be um, really challenged right away. Um, 
Are you have, what, speak on um, the challenges um, uh, about that, that you're seeing if you have experiences with that, particularly the comics that that have um, um, diversity or, or people people of color, and how 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 do you how do you uh, work with that, or how do you address that? Uh, yeah. Well, I, I I could say for my part that um, yeah, there's a there's a <laughs> a very vocal. Uh, presence out there um, of kind of comics fans. I think they think of themselves as traditional comics fans, but there's, uh, the, you know, it's the, there are new fans who are like this and there are fans who've been like this for decades and there are new fans who are open-minded and fans who've been fans for decades who are open-minded. So it's really not anything about being traditional. Uh, it's uh, about being bigoted. And, and uh, what I, I, I hear from them a lot, I'm very active on Twitter, I've gotten threats. I've gotten all sorts of things for for nothing more than kind of uh, talking a little bit about politics in my comics and uh, for having my characters live in the real world. Um, and uh, uh, there's a small percentage of people going to be really unhappy about that, and they make a lot of noise. Um, but I, I do try and kind of take some perspective, and you can just look at how many of them are bots online and things like that to. To, um, to remind yourself that while this is a very dangerous thing in this country, that's a very real thing and has a lot of power, um, in terms of actually being a presence and being representative of what most people who read comics want, it's, it's, it's not. It's a, it's a very small, uh, vocal minority, but a dangerous one, uh, analogous to kind of what's happening in most of our culture, in our politics everywhere, right? It's not, most of the people who are making things bad um, uh, don't represent everyone. It's a small but powerful group. And we, and we do need to both uh, keep their numbers in perspective and not underestimate their ability to harm people, um, particularly creators. This might sound self-interested, but I've seen, um, you know, some of us are more vulnerable than others. And I've seen women creators, trans creators, other creators of color, um, targeted in, in really vicious ways. I've, I've got a pretty thick skin that I've developed, but uh, but it's out there. And, and uh, to me, it, it that's why the positivity and the reinforcement from fans is so crucial. Is um, it's it's medicine against that. You know? yeah, I yeah, oh, oh, I was just going to agree with Saladin. I think that uh, it is important to remain vigilant. You know. Uh, but it is also just as important to remember that they're so loud. They're so, it's such a small percentage and they're, they're so loud because they know that they're losing. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the difference between the responses that we get uh, on the internet, um, the challenges that we get on things like Twitter about, you know, books that we release from uh, diverse creators or with diverse perspectives, um, especially for people of color or people in the LGBT plus community. Um, we get terrible responses on the internet, um, but then we go out into the real world and especially at library conventions, uh, Saladin, if you ever need some real medicine, go to a library convention because the, the responses that you get from, uh, people, from attendees, um, both librarians and, you know, the public is just so heartwarming. You'll get off the internet thinking, oh my God, everything that we're publishing must be so wrong. We're breaking comics. We're making the world a, a terrible place. Uh, and then you'll walk into a hall at a library convention and people will just swarm you. Um, it happened when we released Bingo Love. Uh, people on the internet were very vocal about how wrong it was to have a book about older women who were not thin, who were also black, who were also in love with each other. Like you would have thought that we had released anthrax into the water supply. People were so mad. And then uh, I get to this library convention and I have these elderly women walking up to me and walking up to the creator and they're crying and they, they've never read a comic before they read this book because they didn't think comics were for them. And this is the first time they've seen it or, you know, they gave this book to their kids to, to be able to, to come out to their kids. I mean, people will come up to you and they'll hug you and they'll say, I'm so grateful 
that you took this step. I'm so grateful that you wrote this book. I'm so grateful that you drew this character this way because finally I feel like I'm a part of the narrative. And I think the, uh, the in public um, responses that I have got have far outweighed the small vocal bot driven responses that you get on the internet from people who feel like they never learn to share. They never got past that toddler stage of learning that if you hand a toy to somebody else, it just means you both get that toy. It doesn't mean that toy is no longer yours. And uh, yeah, I just, I think it's important. As you said, stay vigilant, but don't, don't let it get you down. They're loud because they're small. Deirdre? I agree with um, both Saladin and Chloe that um, first, that one of the things I was experiencing was looking for comics at big conventions, comics, you know, created, written, or illustrated by creators of color. And that was, it was such a daunting task to kind of shift through, you know, Jacob Javits at New York Comic Con or other big city uh, comic conventions and try to find that representation. It was my inspiration for wanting to put on shows that were celebrating comic creators of color, um, not just for the content, but for the community and to bring people around who could, who were hungry for the material and who were just so grateful um, to have these stories um, that were being written, you know, toiled with, written in silence by these creators. And then all of a sudden you bring the creator together with the reader and it's a beautiful affirmation. And that works also with young people. One of the things that I had to do as a natu uh, an outgrowth of these convenings was to have young people start learning how to create their own stories because the inspiration is almost instantaneous whereby they see representation now which is fantastic for young minds um, but they feel they have their own voice and their own unique take and perspective on what what's happening in this world or other worlds and they're ready to start telling their stories in graphic form and so that's kind of a positive um outcome of being excluded is kind of how it has inspired others to kind of take the torch and begin to write yeah and you know these um these are wonderful answers and, and, and one reason i asked is because i for any of the participants out there who may feel any kind of trepidation or hesitation about bringing more comics into your collections or doing any kind of comics programming, um, remember, remember that there's so much more positive that comes out of it and that, um, you, you know, you can feel empowered to, to, um, to share comics, uh, among your communities because your communities are really craving it and don't, you know, don't feel that, um, that, you know, that they're like, Oh, I'm afraid of the backlash or the pushback. Um, because, you know, it's, again, there's just such a high demand for it and you are representing your communities. So, um, so, you know, feel, feel empowered to do so. Um, I do want to ask the, pa the panelists, um, and I, you know, I know we're, we're going to look into the crystal ball here a little bit. Um, what do you think the future um, might hold as we see this trend towards more um, inclusion of, um, or just inclusion in general in comics? Um, what do we see, what do you think, um, what do you think it's going to look like, let's say five years later? I mean, there's been so much change in the, like the past five years. Um, yeah, so let's, let's peer into the crystal ball and then let's share your thoughts, please. Um, I, I think that right now we're getting ready to, to pass through the eye of the, the needle. And I think we're going to start expanding from, oh, finally, we have actual creators of color telling their stories. Woo, I feel seen, to we have actual creators of color telling a myriad of stories, telling their stories and your stories and telling stories we've never seen before and playing with format and, you know, delving into memoir and, and delving into more experimentation. Um, I think that's the natural growth that, that you see is first you see yourself in comics and then you put yourself in comics and then the sky's the limit. You, you see how far you can push yourself in comics. Um, and hopefully we'll also start to see more people who have up till now um, been self-publishing um, start being appreciated uh, yeah. by larger publishers and really embraced by larger publishers. I think that's the 
we're, we're getting ready to flip over from, oh, I don't know about this diversity thing to, oh, it seems like this diversity thing might make us some money to uh, what diversity thing? We just publish books by everybody because everybody deserves to be published. So that's my, that's my blue sky. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, maybe I'll be a bit more uh, uh, <laughs> hard-nosed, I suppose, um, wh which is to say, um, on the one hand, I'm incredibly optimistic. I, I don't worry at all about creators. Um, there's, you know, I'm 43 years old, and despite the fact that I'm sort of representing these teenage heroes, right, but I'm in touch quite a lot with young, uh, young fans and young creators, and uh, it's, you know, the future is in good hands uh, as far as that goes as far as people able to tell their stories very well. Um, what, what doesn't change or what only changes with constant fighting is the machine itself, right? And um, the idea that our stories uh, are going to, uh, you know, progress is not a natural or inevitable thing. It doesn't happen in a straight line. And I worry sometimes that um, we, we can pat ourselves on the back so much. Um, that we, um, and, and this is not to say that this is what Chloe was saying, but I'm, 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 I'm zooming out here. Um, I do this on my days where I'm feeling too optimistic, right? And then I say, well, and then I look around at what, for instance, the creator lists look like at the big two, right? At DC and Marvel, for instance, right now. And it's, it's still almost all white guys at both places, right? Um, uh, in terms of people who are repeatedly uh, getting work. We have to remember to differentiate between who's kind of on the page and who's creating, right? And uh, so we, we can have these big diverse stables of heroes and we always constantly have to be asking who's making them, who's making the money making them. Um, when indie books come out, who's, you know, who's getting the big pub, you know, publicity pushes and who's not, right? Who's instantly kind of being sniffed at by Hollywood, who's not. And that stuff is always going to reflect our society in general, right? And so I'm, I'm not optimistic that somehow um, you know, it's going to unfold naturally in a good way. I think we need to constantly be fighting in the way that we have been. And as we're learning in our culture in general, uh, sometimes it's one step forward, three steps back, right? And, and, and it's even further back if we're not still pushing. And so on my good days, I try and be optimistic, but every day I try and kind of remember that, uh, you know, you don't keep the things you've got without uh, continuing to fight for them. I... Yeah, I think that um, similar to my own experience, I'm a child of the 70s. There I am dating myself. <laughs> um, and the 1970s, um, it was the kind of the birth of Black children's literature, right? Um, and my family, my mother, my grandmother, my aunts, they gave books as gifts and created in me an appetite for representation as a child that fuels, I think, my whole life, even my life's work, if I really think about it. But it fuels my ability to say there must be a writer out there um, who's doing the work of representing our stories from diverse communities. And so I have to trust that the future um, will be populated by the adults of this generation who are reading Saladin's works and who will never not be looking for Miles Morales to be present in their, you know, their comic book catalogs or who will, who will go to the library and go to bookstores and have an appetite and a voice to demand for diverse books and diverse literature. So I have to put my faith in the readership that we are actually shifting uh, not only their appetite, their taste, but their politics around what they want to see published. Very nice, very nice. You know, it's funny because I like even, um, and I'm gonna date myself as well. I mean, it's a similar generation to you, Deirdre, from the 70s. Um, and then I've, you know, I've, I've considered myself, like I'm aware of, of diversity in comics and I look for it too. Um, and so um, it, even the new agents of Atlas, the, 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 um, the new series um, by- um, uh, Greg. Huh. Yeah, so, yeah, it was, it, there's the features of Filipino character in there. And I was just like, wow, I get super excited just for that. I mean, it's like, you know, I, like, I'm like knocking down the door of the comic store so I can get the, um, get, get dibs on it so you get like three copies of it. So, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm 
I'm also optimistic as well, but, you know, cautiously optimistic. You know, I think it's time. Um, we are under 10 minutes here, and I would love to get it out to the participants to see if they have any questions for our panelists. So um, so for those of you who have questions, you can either chat it through, or I believe or we have the Q&A um, how do we do this? So we have the Q&A. So if you want, if, if, any, if anyone has questions out there for the panelists, we are ready to answer. I do want to, and if, if not, I have, I have another question. Um, actually, as they're typing out or asking questions, um, we, what, in what ways can libraries, um, all libraries, how can, what, what do you think we can do um, to support mm -hmm. creators and publishers? Um, I'll, I'll take a whack at this one. Um, actually, one of the things that I think libraries can do um, to help strengthen diversity in comic books and keep those books coming back um, sort of speaks to, uh, to Saladin's uh, realism and my and, and Deirdre's optimism <laughs> about the future. Um, we have to remember that even though it's easier to make a comic than it is to make a movie or a television show, so it's open to a lot more people, um, it, we do still live in a capitalist society, and uh, if the books don't sell right away, sometimes uh, a comic book publisher or a store will be much less inclined to buy that book or publish that book again. So if you are a library and you know what your demographics are, um, sometimes it just takes a little bit of extra work to try and make sure that you're finding books by diverse creators, speaking with diverse voices, and that you uh, are acquiring those and adding those into your, your acquisitions and collection development plan. Um, I also really recommend partnering with your local comic shop um, to share what your patrons are asking for um, and then see what their customers are asking for because local comic book shops especially uh, are struggling across the nation so they're much more cautious about what they buy um, and their purchases affect the entire market but so do yours if your patrons want something that the local comic book shop is not uh, willing to buy because they're afraid that it might not sell you know share your information and it might lead to uh, more people buying those books, which leads to those diverse creators being able to make more books. Okay, thank you, Chloe. You know, we have a few questions here now popping up. Um, here's a good one. What are the best ways? To, what are the best ways to find diverse comics? Um, I use a lot of blogs. But yeah, what are the best ways to find diverse comics? Anyone want to take a stab at it? Other than it's it's pretty it, there are pretty exhaustive resources out there. I think uh, it's if if you just get online looking for them, they're hard not to find once you start digging. There's a lot of dedic there's a dedicated community out there online, sort of uh, cheerleading for this stuff. You just got to go looking. You got to look for. I mean, one of the things I hope, I'm hoping the graphic novel and comics uh, roundtable is a good resource as well, and that's something I think I'm, um, we're probably going to um, be developing. Um, so um, look for that. Um, let's see. Let's. The world of comics is so huge, and for libraries that don't have much in the way of comics right now, where do we suggest we start with our collections? That's a great question. Um, I, I think it depends again on your your demographics. Um, of course, you want to to a lot of people want to be able to offer the the classics like the canon. Um, but before you sit down and say, well, I have to have books A, B, and C, ask yourself why you think the canon is the canon. Um, and ask yourself whether that canon reflects the real needs and the real tastes um, of the people that you you serve. Um, also, never forget that the publishers are here to help you. Reach out to publishers and say, hey, I have a small budget. I don't know what to buy, or I can only buy five books. Uh, you can often get previews and review copies so you can see what it is that you're getting before you, you put your, your money out there. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask this next question for Deirdre. What is about what is it about the actual medium of comics that allows and has the possibility for expressing diversity so powerfully? You talked about visual literacy, so I would like to hear your, your 
answer. 100%. Because, um, especially for young people, but even for adults, everyone's literacy level is different. And so what comics and graphic novels bring, obviously, is uh, an, a written narrative a, alongside a very visual narrative. And so what readers really enjoy in comics is the fact that you can really glean much of the story's context about the character's moods, about tone, about power dynamics in the visual medium in and of itself. And so there are fewer barriers um, to comprehension because of that pairing of the visual narrative with the written word. And also it has everything to do with the way uh, stories are told pictorially and the sequencing of stories. And um, again, cultural context, historical context, you know, your sense of space and place is much um, more vividly um, drawn in comics than sometimes it is drawn in words. Um, for the imagination of the reader. And so I think that's one of the reasons why it's such a powerful form um, to affect you intellectually um, in terms of uh, text literacy, but also visual literacy in the ways that we're responding to color, to character, to facial expressions and, and other uh, visual characteristics. No, I, I totally agree. I just, the immediacy of comics, the visual aspect of it, I mean, it's right there in your face. You see it. It's like, it's a, it's um, uh, almost like a, a little bit of a visceral reaction almost. Um, and I remember having a discussion about why um, reading uh, John Lewis's March was uh, so much more impactful than just reading from like a regular prose yeah. uh, graphic novel. And there's just something about it, the, the way that there's the atmosphere, the, the word, the, just the combination, that dynamic is just, is just unbelievably powerful. And I think it's a lot of it's because we are hardwired to, to do that. I mean, I know we are, we are visual creatures. And so um, that marrying of the words, um, the images together, um, it makes it so much more uh, powerful that way. Um, we are running out of time. And I'm, unfortunately, I'm going to have to wrap it up. But I do want to say thank you to our, um, to our esteemed panelists. It was really an honor to be able to talk to you about this. It was really great to meet you all. Um, we, let's see here. So here on, um, you'll see the slide here, the contact information up on your screens. Um, don't forget if you are attending the American Library Association annual conference in Washington, DC. Um, I don't know why I said that whole thing out. It's the ALA. Um, remember to uh, go ahead and, and check out the schedule to see um, all of the, um, the, the, the round table um, events and sessions. If you want to learn more about comics and um, and libraries, we um, we are a growing force. Uh, comics and li uh, comics librarians are are, um, are, are are you know that's the place to be. So um, so thank you to to everybody. Um, thank you to President Lloyd Garcia Fibo for um, for her introduction for hosting this um, this webinar. Um, and I think we are done. Thanks, everybody. I believe this is recorded, so it will be archived and, and um, will be uh, ready. Um, I guess Tina will be. Will go ahead and speak to that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Have a great day, everyone.